If we're not willing to do whatever it takes to figure out how to accomplish our mission, it's because we are not totally aware of the consequences of what happens if our mission doesn't matter, if we don't accomplish our mission. Luckily, we don't have to imagine a world without Billy Graham. We don't have to imagine a world without Martin Luther King Jr. We don't have to imagine a world without Mother Teresa. But if you don't accomplish your mission, we are going to live in a world where your mission doesn't happen. And until you get so clear on the consequences of what happens if the civil rights movement doesn't happen, if Mother Teresa doesn't feed the poor in Calcutta, if Billy Graham doesn't go all around the world preaching the gospel, until you get a revelation of what doesn't happen when you do not accomplish what you are put on this earth to do, you're not going to figure out. We are here today with a baller, Nicole Valance. Nicole is an acclaimed speaker, leadership coach, pastor, and church consultant. She works with top industry leaders, influencers, and celebrities, the top 1% of churches, thousands of marketplace leaders and missionaries across the country, as well as the global church community in Japan, Australia, and Canada. She has shared the stage with thought leaders such as Brian Covey and Vic Keller. Tim Story says Nicole's style and years of research are changing lives. If you or your company are ready for a power surge and an amazing transformation, Nicole is the one to make it happen. She speaks on creating a cult-like culture you're obsessed with, developing a leadership pipeline to produce a high-impact team, ministry in the marketplace, and her favorite, leaving the church. This is how we change the world. Woo! Nicole says, if your mission matters to you, you must empower your leaders and create a cult-like culture you're obsessed with to produce unstoppable momentum in your church or business. Man, today we're going to help that person who's interested in that kind of impact. And maybe they're frustrated. They haven't broken through to be able to get that kind of splash they've wanted. Or maybe they're just not even able to work in the vocation that specific calling yet because maybe they have a nine to five that they're trying to escape or some other issue right in their life. You're going to help us today get them in touch with their internal values, their core intrinsic stuff. Welcome, Nicole. I'm so glad to see you. Thank you so much, Adam. I'm glad to be here. Tell us about your background, how you ended up here, this passion of yours, because you're obviously working in your genius and this is what we're here for. Yeah, Adam, I am obsessed with being the kind of leader that gets results. So no matter what your mission is, if it matters, we must be the kind of leaders that get it done. We must get results. I've been in the ministry for almost 20 years and I'm pretty convinced about our mission and that it matters. What I've had to do is figure out, okay, what kind of leader do I need to be? What kind of systems and structures do I need to put in place? What kind of culture do I need to create that mm. people are so obsessed with, they wanna be about? How do I communicate and cast a vision that is so clear, that is so compelling that people want to give their lives to be a part of it. And that's where I work with churches and pastors and leaders, organizations to create cultures they're obsessed with, to become the kind of leaders that get results. We, Adam, we're given just a little bit of time here on this earth. We've got to figure out what our mission is and we've got to give our lives to a mission that matters and we can't do it alone. We have to become experts, masters at rallying people around a vision and a mission so that we can make a difference, we can make an impact. If someone is mission driven in this way, but let's say they're not working in it, but they know there's something that they know that maybe it's something they're supposed to do that's more meaningful, something bigger than where they're at. They know they can do important things where they are. They know they can serve and be a light and that's in place. But the, where the rubber meets the road, if they're not doing what they believe that they desire, they should be doing, what's a first step they can do? to even if it's a thought process to raise awareness, to get to the point where they can start making moves toward getting into that full-time daily work of that thing. Adam, I don't think it's so much, yes, we can, there's a lot of different things that we can do. I think we have to start with, listen, the pain to, how's that saying go, Adam? The pain to stay the same has to become greater than the pain to change, right? Is that how it goes? I think that if we're not willing to do whatever it takes to figure out how to accomplish our mission, it's because we are not totally aware of the consequences of what happens if our mission doesn't matter, if we don't accomplish our mission. Luckily, we don't have to imagine a world without Billy Graham. We don't have to imagine a world without Martin Luther King Jr. We don't have to imagine a world without Mother Teresa. But if you don't accomplish your mission, we are going to live in a world where your mission 
action doesn't happen. And until you get so clear on the consequences of what happens if the civil rights movement doesn't happen, if Mother Teresa doesn't feed the poor in Calcutta, if Billy Graham doesn't go all around the world preaching the gospel, until you get a revelation of what doesn't happen when you do not accomplish what you are put on this earth to do, you're not going to figure it out. But if you will ever get a vision and get so convicted and rooted in what you know you're called to do, oh, you will. I know you, leader. I know you, influencer. You are going to figure it out. You are going to say, come hell or high water, you're going to be like a pit bull and say, I am getting this done. And the greatest leaders, Martin Luther King Jr., they had a dream. They had a vision. They were willing to do whatever it took to get it done. But I think that we don't realize how important we are. We're not fully convicted. You know what? There's two things. We can start a revolution only. I like to teach leaders this, Adam. The root word of, of radical is radicalis. That means that whatever you are rooted in, whatever you deeply believe, you become radical about. And the only people that change the world are people that are crazy, radical, on fire, obsessed, and we need those kind of leaders. If you ever get find something that you're absolutely radical about, you are so rooted in this ideology, this philosophy that you're willing to do whatever it takes to get it done. That's when you're willing to figure it out. That's Man, that's a phenomenal answer. I didn't expect anything even close to that. That's to start considering what happens if you don't. Like picturing a world without Billy Graham. Imagine that. Imagine if Billy was, I don't know what he did when he's probably been preaching the gospel since he was three or something. But if he was selling shoes or polishing shoes on a shoe corner back in some day and let his life, the fact that he had a growing family or he had to, or he had to pay for his rent, get in the way of him taking that radical approach That's that right. easily, if most of us to try to, I know me, when you try to reach out and to step out, people are like, oh my gosh, what are you going to do about this? What are, you're just going to leave your nursing career? You're, what? All that time in college? Yes. And then there's all these things that fill in that can actually yeah. get in the way and stop that. But to sit there and say, take some contemplation time and think about what it is that you want to do and then think about not giving that to the world. That's right. Man, that is how I had a recent colleague in, I mentioned, have you met, have you heard of Joe Blackburn yet? Have you met him? No, I haven't. Joe's a pretty awesome guy executive coach for decades. And I was talking to him recently and look, this is what he asked me. He goes, so I hear you talking, you know, you're doing coaching and you got the podcast going and man, doing great. Awesome. He goes, your story is pretty amazing. And the people that follow us know about my wife and I and the drugs and the affairs and the divorce. He's, but why aren't you, why don't you have a book right now? That's what he asked me. And it kind of caught me off. This is a few months ago. And I said, because I got to get a couple things in place first. I want to make sure that this infrastructure is there. And I, I gave him a, the smartest business answer I could. They're like the most reasonable answer. I am being coached by a strategist and I'm giving this answer that we've worked out. And he goes, oh, that's your problem. You're thinking about what you need and not the impact that this book's going to make on the world in someone's life who needs it right now. So Dang. Good. All right, Joe. Dude, we just met 38 seconds ago on the phone. <laughs> And that's what he told me. And this is your message. Yeah. And this needs to hit home with somebody because someone is losing because the person listening to this show right now who has that thing inside them is not executing on it for really good, responsible reasons. That's right. You think about Joshua and Caleb. They were called, along with the 10 spies, to conquer the promised land. And they went into, they were going into the promised land and the 10 spies says, oh, we see the giants. And then they saw themselves as grasshoppers. But Joshua and Caleb saw the giants and said, oh, we can take this. And why they were motivated by, by their purpose, by their mission. And that is what is needed to overcome all of our insecurities, all of the things that we see as limitations. And it's the only way to conquer the giants in the things that are going to get in the way of us conquering the promised land. It's incredible. Yeah, this, <clears throat> yep. This, is, this reminds me of the New Hampshire license plate motto that it says, live free or die. And I love that. And Tony uses the word must, right? Tony Robbins, he calls this your must. I call this your live and die decision, your life or death decision. And I came up with this in, when I was a nurse and I used to tell people that I had to do this thing that was inside of me. And they would say it was too radical, you're too extreme, you're too intense and all these things. Because the language that I would use, and I was embarrassed about this language for a long time. And then I realized the idea, the intention behind, I'm going to tell you the phrase, 
the, the, the intention behind the phrase is what anyone who has a mission inside them, a, a dream, a calling to live, they have to have it because it's the same as what Tony says in the must. So I'm no longer embarrassed about how psychotic it sounds. I used to say with my stethoscope around my, working in the ER, I would literally say, if I can't get free of this, I was talking about that time, the rat race, the nine to five, the control of someone over my life. If I couldn't get out and do my own thing, I'd rather go into a bathtub, open my veins and call it a day. That's what I used to say. And people would look at me like I might need to get the next bed with the leather straps. And I would. But I'm not embarrassed about that anymore because if you don't feel that way, you don't stand a chance of getting it anyway because the world's going to kick you in the freaking teeth exactly. and make you want to quit. You got to get that. You have to have it. Yes. You yeah, do. you got to have it. Yeah, you do. And Adam, we were talking the other day and I said, I said, I don't want to sound crazy, but <laughs> yeah. Jim Collins says that the greatest organizations have cult-like cultures. And I started thinking, yep. I said, what do I do for churches and companies? I, I was like, I'm going to help you create a cult. Now, not the kind that drinks Kool-Aid, but man, it, people do have to drink what you're selling. They do have to want to follow you. That You have to create an environment that you are so obsessed with. You have to have a mission that is so compelling that people are willing to do anything and everything short of, they're just about willing to do anything and everything because they believe in the mission so much. And yeah, cult-like cultures, bathtub with, how did you say it, Adam? <laughs> That's sick trauma nurse phraseology. Okay, I was don't like, use I don't that. in my family. Get your own people. Yeah. <laughs> don't use Adam's <laughs> nutso language. Yeah, it's important anyway, though, Adam, I get it. For the leader who's listening right now, who this is striking a chord with, or who potentially wants to be one of those leaders. What is something that you can offer them in this moment? What's a couple of your philosophies? Riff a little bit about how you help people, these leaders, create these impacts that create this cult-like following. When we talk about leaving the church, this is how we change the world. The reality is a lot of us as Christians, we don't know what our purpose is. We don't know what our calling is. We separate the sacred and the secular. And I, this is the responsibility that, that pastors and leaders have is to communicate and cast this vision. But people, Adam, they don't know who they are. They think that, oh, the pastors and mm. the staff and the elders and the leaders in the church, that is sacred. But what I do as a nurse, what I do as a business owner, that's secular. There is no difference between the sacred and the secular. Adam, did you know that 138 out of 140 of Jesus's miracles we're done in the marketplace, in the marketplace, in businesses, Monday through Saturday, not during church on Sunday. And when I say leaving the church, this is how we change the world is a lot of times the message from pastors and leaders is come to church and we want you to volunteer on Sundays and we want you to get involved in a small group. And I understand, but people don't have the identity and COVID was the great revealer of the problem in the church is because we had people that were going to church to check the box, to volunteer, to do the thing, but because they didn't understand that they were ministers, that they were full-time ministers, even if ministry wasn't their vocation because they didn't understand that they were missionaries because they didn't understand that they were ministers. They didn't really realize that we might not be able to go to church, but I am the church. I am the answer. I tell people like, don't, you know, I have a girlfriend. She, she owns a hair salon and she was like, yeah, I don't really go to church that much. And I said, I was like, what you don't realize is that your church just doesn't meet on Sunday. You meet Monday through Saturday when your stylists come into the salon, when your clients come in. And if you ever get a revelation that actually you're already on mission, when you walk outside the front door of your house to your neighbors, to your, to the stylist, to your employees, to your clients. And I say, leaving the church is how we change the world because actually our job, Adam, as pastors and leaders is to empower people and to release them to go into the world. And our job as Christians is to go into people's every single day lives and make a difference. I talk to pastors, Adam, and I'm so passionate. We train people to be greeters on Sunday, right? We tell people to mm. be nice and serve coffee. What if you just did that every single day of the week? What if you just served people at your job? What if you just served people in your life with the intention of impacting them for the Lord? Man, what if people felt that way when they came to your house? Yes. What if when they walk in the house, you offer a cold glass of water or their favorite drink or whatever the thing is, yes. right? Maybe they love Trulies. Maybe they love seltzers, right? And you offer them one. Oh my gosh. But then we got to get into theological debates. No, we don't have to get into debates about drinking and, and tattoos and we don't have to do that. That's what some people, that's why we got to leave the church. So we don't talk about that nonsense and we go out and change the world. 
that's amazing. However you want to do it, we got, you got to go change the world. And the way that you change the, your world is by being connected to people, by loving them where they're at. I think a big problem with especially pastors, Adam, is they don't have any people in their life that have questions about God that are far from God, that they're in the church world, but they're not connected to people's actual mm. problems and needs. So we yep. got to get connected. They're insulated. They're insulated. Yep. They're insulated. So, not, and that leads to out of touch. Out of touch. You can't, John Maxwell says this, you cannot have compassion on who you're not connected to. You just can't, you cannot. Beautiful. You can't, you can't have compassion on who you're not connected to. We've got to connect to people. We got to serve people in our regular lives. And if the church, if the people of God, if the Christians would get a revelation of how important they are, of, of what our mission is, the truth is, Adam, people that are not Christian, they're open to God. They're wanting to know, they're wanting answers. They're wanting to know what on earth they're here for. And we have the answer. So what's the answer that you would give to someone to help that salon, that stylist, or the other person, because the average American Christian who would declare belief in God, I'm a Christian, because we know the numbers, according to Barna, are the Barna Institute, the numbers of people in this country, the stats that say they're Christian, the number's huge. It's huge. The percentage that attend a formal building event on a Sunday or a Saturday or a Wednesday are way smaller. And the people that study the word of God, AKA Jesus in his words inside a trusted translation of the Bible that's not been polluted by kings and empire churches. Should I get it? We won't get into that. I'll, I'll have, no, I'll have fun with that. <laughs> so we got to stay on point. All the things, Adam. That's, yeah, yeah. I got so my master's how, in theology, so let's go. Nice. All right. The answer would be this. To those people who believe that place, the church, go. I don't go to church as much as I should. That idea. How do we help them break the paradigm that is keeping them from their life. That's keeping them from the faith that they would love walking in on a daily basis because religion is the cloud over their mind. It's the veil in front of their eyes is religion. It's the need to do something, the need to go somewhere, to perform something, to say it, to stand up, to sit down, to kneel. How do I say? People won't even pray words out loud because they're embarrassed. What is that? That's the weight of religion. So how do we help them break that paradigm and understand that Jesus walks with them where they are? Yep. So here's what I ask every single person I meet. I'll tell you about a conversation I had with my Uber driver. I was, I was on a trip to go to do a retreat at a church in Oklahoma and my Uber driver is driving me to the airport. And of course, whenever I meet somebody out of my pray every single day, God brings someone into my life that is searching for you. Right. Mm -hmm. And every single day, God brings people into my life that are searching for him. So my Uber driver, I said, so do you have a church you go to? Are you a Christian? He says, yes, I'm a Christian. And I said, okay, what church do you go to? And he told me a church in Santa Clarita that he goes to, but it has been my experience, Adam, that just because somebody says that they're a Christian and just because somebody says that they go to church or they have a church doesn't mean that they have a relationship with God and doesn't mean that they've actually ever had somebody tell them how to go to heaven. I asked him, I said, have you ever had anybody clearly explain to you how to go to heaven and how to have a relationship with God? And he said, no. And I said, can I tell you? I said, his name was Gary. I said, Gary, God loves you so much. I said, but the bad news is we've all sinned, right? Like we've all done something wrong. I said, typically we think that the way that we're going to go to heaven is by being a good person. I said, but good people don't go to heaven. Only those saved by Jesus do. I said, so the bad news is we've all messed up, but <laughs> the good news is if you're in a courtroom and the judge says, are you innocent or guilty? And you're guilty, you have to pay the penalty. So the bad news is we have to pay the penalty, but good news, Gary, Jesus steps in that courtroom and he says, I love Gary so much that even though he deserves to pay the penalty, I'm going to pay the penalty for him. And that's what Jesus did when he died on the cross 2000 years ago. And God proved that he was God when he rose Jesus from the dead on the third day. And I said, Gary, so do you want to pay the penalty for your sins? Or do you want to put your faith and trust that Jesus paid the penalty for you? And he said, well, I want to put my faith in Jesus. So we prayed in that car for him to accept Christ. And he said, Nicole, he said, thank you so much. I've never had anybody explain that to me. He says, I never understood how to have a relationship with God and go to heaven. 
And Adam, like this particular church that he goes to, whenever people tell me that they go to this church, and it's one of the largest churches in Santa Clarita, I always preach the gospel to them and tell them how to have a relationship with God because at their church, they don't share the gospel. They don't tell mm. people clearly how to go to heaven. It's come to church. It's tithe. It's serve. But it's not. Get in a small group. It's get, get in a small group. group. But it's Come to the barbecue. Here's how to go to heaven. Here's how to have a relationship with God. And once you do that, it's go tell somebody else. That's the Great Commission. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. And the Great Commission is go into all the world. We need to, I'm not saying that you can't invite people to church, but we need to stop inviting people to church and going to church by itself. We need to start inviting people into a relationship with God and going into the world to do that. And we come to church on Sunday to get vision and, and to invite people. But the whole reason we do everything we do is to help people have that relationship with God. And that only is possible if they accept Christ. And if we can get every single Christian, Adam, if every single actual Christian in America would just preach the gospel to 10 people over their lifetime, America gets saved. Yeah. The so world's inside out. It's yeah. So it's just, it's incredibly important. So that's what I mean when I say to the business owner, like my friend that owns that salon, she was doing my hair a few months ago and one of her stylists, I asked her the same question. I said, have you ever had anybody explain to you how to go to heaven? And she's no, not really. I explained it to her. She's oh my gosh, she's that makes sense. She got saved. She gave her life to Christ. And it was so easy because people are so open. Yeah. I'm all, I'm like, <clears throat> I'm feeling this nudge inside. I need to ask. I would, it was like under my radar or above, above my head. I don't know what it is, but I, I wouldn't have thought that the simplicity of asking that direct question to people who would say that they go to church or that they're Christians. Now, I also know that this, I also, like I said, I know the stats, the numbers of people who actually walk in an active faith, following the Lord's will for their life, wanting his decisions for their life, go with that leading with or without going to some building on a weekly or monthly basis. That number is very small. And like, we know that, right? But I still wouldn't like, that's beautiful. And yeah. that's what, like, that's absorbing in me people to do that, Adam. We can't get people to give their whole life and follow him if they don't start by accepting him. It's like yeah. at, at a very, at the very start, we have to get people to accept Christ and then, yeah. And then see them encounter God so that their life can truly be transformed. Yeah. Start with a base level fundamental and people get out of your mind that the word church means a building or a location or a place that you attend that has never been the intent of that word ever. It's never been anything but people. That word is a word for people who believe in Jesus's way. That's what that word means. Somehow, some way that got turned inside out too and has been polluted. But all right, man, let's, woo, yeah, fun stuff. You need a break? We're we'll having church, Adam. <laughs> I love it. We talked about, you, you discussed the idea of influence as part of creating this cult-like culture. What are you finding in terms of leaders helping people? What are things that the leaders can do? What are ways the leaders can be? Their energy, the, the types of questions, the things that they do on a weekly basis. I saw something on your Instagram, and this might be the, a nice specific question to ask. You talked about how we don't need this business meeting or that business meeting, but you need to be meeting with your leaders on a weekly basis or like a, a, your one-on-ones. You were talking about your one-on-ones, right? You want to tell us a little bit about that because I think that's pretty valuable. Yeah. So this is when I, I'm thinking about an organization, right? Be it your company, your church. We have to talk about if we want to have influence, if we want to have impact, we have to have a system that produces a high impact team. We have to have a team that we're influencing, right? That is accomplishing the mission of our organization. The, what I teach leaders is there are certain things that you have to do that are non-negotiable if you want to influence your people. And there's a number of things that you have to do. And one of those things is one-on-ones. You must have one-on-one -on -one meetings with five to 10 or 12 of your people, your direct reports, your staff, your key volunteers every single week. And those meetings have to be number one. How are you? How are you doing? How's your family? You actually need to know the anniversaries, the names of their children, their birthdays, what they care about, where they're at, because the truth is we can't lead people to where we want them to go if we don't know where they're at 
We can't help them become more than they are right now if we don't know where they're at right now. And we owe it to the people that we lead that are a part of our organization to serve them, to care about them. 60% of all Gen Zers say that they will stay at a company for less money, money if they feel like their manager actually cares about them. That's huge. Yeah. People need that. You must be doing one-on-ones with your team. It's absolutely irresponsible not to. You cannot, you cannot be a leader and not be caring about, wait, we might call you boss. We might, you might have a great 401k plan. You might get all the accolades, but you will never, ever be a great leader. And we will never say that you did the job that you were assigned to do. If you don't care about meeting with the people that, that are directly, that you're directly called to influence. It looks like doing those one-on-ones. How are you? And then people need to be celebrated for, again, this is that culture you're obsessed with. In those one-on-one meetings, you have to say, here's what you're doing right. Here's the behaviors. Here's how you're contributing to the kind of culture that we want to create. And yes, if there's things that they're doing that are contributing to the culture that we don't want to create, those have to be addressed. And then we have to hold them accountable and develop them in what we want them to do to move the needle forward. But it's like you can't, you cannot impact and have influence on people that you're not meeting with, that you're not connected with. You just cannot have a high impact team. And again, if your mission matters right? Then we must create a culture where, where we're influencing people, where we're doing these one-on-ones. Yeah. This is a great conversation for, like you said, it has to be for the person whose mission matters because there might be someone listening. I can't imagine a closed minded cynic abuser listening to this podcast, a boss that lords their power over someone. But I will say, if you look around, if you have if you're the CEO of a company, the founder or, or the boss of a department that has some size to it, and you look at the culture that is around you, that's under, that's beneath you positionally, and it's not as you're describing, they already know that they don't have a cohesive team. They know it. They know that for whatever reason, the people do their jobs because of fear. It's fear of getting in trouble, reprisal, like whatever the thing, losing money, getting fired, but it's never because of anything other than that. Like what you're talking about is high level emotional maturity. You're talking about soft skills. You're talking about equanimity as Ed Milet likes to say. And that's true. And I've worked in roles where consulting the C-level on his or her communication style or engagement of their reports and their employees to literally be able to change the culture along the direction you're saying. So anybody can email me or DM me if they want to get some tips on that because that is still, you work that as your life. And I've done that in my experience. So if you're doing that now, like people, we're going to get to that in a little bit, how people can get a hold of you and potentially have you consult and come out. Now, speaking of that, a little bit of a lane change. I saw you on a snowboard talking about being buckled in and trapped versus maybe some freedom you want to, are you pastoring actively in services where people attend and because leaving the church, that can be a, like a, what a word play almost, which it is a word play. I, yeah. Yeah. So there I, you go. Yeah. So my ex-husband and I, we co-pastored our church. We started with eight people in our living room. We had, we, we grew the church to three services, hundreds of volunteers, dozens and dozens of people were giving their life to Christ on Sundays and through people preaching the gospel so I'm passionate about, about helping pastors and churches. And yes, so I travel, I consult churches, I speak, but for the purpose of mobilizing the Christian, mobilizing the people that are going to the church inside the four walls to go into the world and, mm. and preach the gospel. So like that message that I was doing when I had my snowboard, which I love snowboarding. So yeah, brought all my snowboard, all my things to, to Oklahoma from California. But my message was, what are we called to? So if I'm called to snowboard and I'm not rooted and buckled in to my snowboard, I'm not gonna be able to do it. So if we are not, if we are called to do a thing and we're not rooted and buckled in to the truth of who we're called to be and what we're called to do, we're never gonna get it done. That just goes back to whatever you are convicted about, whatever you believe about who you are and what you're called to do, what your mission is, you have to be rooted in that first if you're going to fulfill your assignment, if you're going to do what, 
what God has called you to do. And a lot of people believe, unfortunately, that they're called to maybe go to church or read their Bible every day or, but that's not the call of the call on our life is to go into the world, is to be a missionary, is to be a minister in our everyday life. And yeah, so when I went to that church in particular, my whole message was whatever you're rooted in, you become radical about. And we need people to become radical about the right things. You have Hitler, he changed the world, didn't he? Oh, he changed the yep. whole world. We didn't like how he changed the world, why? Because he was rooted in an ideology and become, became radical about that ideology. He changed the world for the bad, but I spoke before, you get people like Martin Luther King Jr., Billy Graham, you get them rooted in a truth, you get them convicted about an ideology, whoo, they're gonna snowboard, they're gonna change the whole entire world, and we've gotta be rooted and grounded in some things that are true. There's a, there, if we ever get unbuckled from the things that are true, we're not gonna be able to snowboard. And when you snowboard, you have your bindings, and you gotta be buckled into the snowboard, there's no way I'm going down a double black diamond, Adam, if I'm not buckled into my snowboard. There's just absolutely no way. I'm not, I'm crazy, but I'm not that crazy. And get down it all right. You might, yeah, you might get down. <laughs> you don't know what you're in it. But that's the tragedy, yeah. right? It's so many people that get to the end of their life and they never really did anything because yep. they never really had anything that they were passionate about, that they were convicted about. It's an incredibly important for us to have things that we're convicted about and that we're rooted in and I know that it's in the truth. That leads me to an awesome question. This is, I'll say that my question is awesome. I'm sure there will be. <laughs> Something comes out of my mouth sometimes, like I hear it as I'm saying it. The first time, and unfortunately only time, I ever snowboarded, it was very difficult for me. So I'm going to have you, you're gonna, we're going to talk about, the, here's the intention I need you to shape this little context for. We're going to help someone break a paradigm in their mind that they're operating in that is probably the opposite of what they should be and it's working against them and they're frustrated with the results they're getting because they're not they're doing it the opposite way that it should be done and here's the story I was snowboard I was fresh I was like a couple weeks out of Afghanistan from combat and I went out there we I was like it, it felt amazing I'm not a snow guy that's why I live in the Tampa Bay area but I was snowboarding, never done it before, but I was always athletic. I've skateboarded when I was a kid, did all the things. Didn't matter. When I got on that snowboard, that was a different universe. And I used my skateboarding knowledge or conditioning in my muscle memory to lean back on that board, to lean back on the board and almost what I thought would be surfing or riding my skateboard, lifting the nose up, leaning back on the tail. Now, after several crashes, one that I found out later tore my labrum in my left shoulder, had to have that surgically repaired. And after what we used to call on the ski slope, we would call it like we left a yard. I left a yard sale out there on the hill, right? All my gloves, my hat, the goggles, everything's flying off. I'm flipping upside down. I was a mess for a solid 45 minutes to an hour trying to do it my way in a brand new thing. A guy comes up to me super mellow, relaxed, friendly, open. And he, and I'll never, I don't even know his name because it was just an encounter like that. It doesn't even matter, but it was lasting. He goes, if I could give you a little tip, I said, please do. <laughs> he goes, what you're going to want to do when you start, he goes, shift your weight ever so slightly forward. So you're it's going to feel unnatural. I said, oh, kind of like turning the opposite way on a motorcycle. If I want to turn right, I got to lean right while the handlebars go a little bit left. It feels really awkward. And that's the way you turn a motorcycle. And he's, yeah. So I do this and I could connect to it. So I lean forward on the board and it was smooth all the way down. First, right? Like it was that really? fast of a change because I was coachable. But beyond being coachable, I was getting result, undesired results because I was leaning on a thought process that I thought I knew what I was doing but just couldn't get to work. So I tried to use more force. Yeah. I don't know if anybody can relate to that. But he gave me that one shift. I did it, and it changed the entire day. And I went forward from there. I was able to carve. I was cutting a little. Like, I was doing it. And then I've never done it since. And, man, it makes me sad because I hope to do it again someday. It's been over, it's been over 10 years. But anyway, that type of mindset, what are leaders doing that are working against them in, in the workplace, in the church place? Guys, this does not, you don't need to be on your face praying to the Lord for three hours a day, facing east out the window, talking to kings to be living your faith 
or to be influencing out of your good heart in the workplace. This doesn't require that. So listen to what she's getting ready to give you because whatever kind of paradigm shift you can offer, it will immediately change the results that the organization is getting. So Daniel Goleman wrote an article for uh, Harvard Business Review and it's called Leadership That Gets Results. And Adam, if your listeners text lead to 33777, I'll send them the article and an assessment so that they can take an assessment on their the styles of leadership. I'll explain that just now. But yeah, text lead to 33777. This is one of the most important articles that you can read <clears throat> if you want to get results as a leader, right? We want to learn how to snowboard, right? But we're used to certain behaviors. We have to learn the different behaviors if we want to get results. So we must become the kind of leaders that get, get results. So if you imagine this, Adam, I don't golf. Do you golf? No. Okay. I used to a long time ago. Okay. So I, I took lessons a long time ago to, but it never panned out. But can you imagine trying to use, <laughs> shocker, trying to use a putter, right? To drive the ball all the way down the, the course. No, like, or trying to use the sand wedge to try to putt. It doesn't work. With our leadership, we are used to one or two styles that work in some situations and with some people. But one style of leadership doesn't work for every single type of team and every single type of person that we're called to lead or every single season in our organization. We must learn the six styles of leadership that Daniel Goleman says are tied to the four areas of emotional intelligence if we want to get results. Mm. So there's the, the visionary style of leadership. This leader says, come with me, come follow me, and we're gonna accomplish the mission. And the visionary style of leadership has the greatest impact on the culture of the organization. Whereas the, co the course of leader, which is really good. I imagine if we're on the battlefield, the course of leader says, do what I tell you right now, do what I say right now. And if we're at war or in a battle, I guess we do, we need a commanding, do what I say. It's there are times. right now, but that doesn't work. That does not work for the most part in organizations, there might be some times where we need to lead that way. But if we're house used fire, to, house fire, house fire, yeah. get out now, right? <laughs> but sometimes we leave people like that. Leaders are frustrated because yeah. they're saying, do what I do right now, be the boss, do what I say, here's the task, here's the job. And we wonder why it's not getting the kind of results and creating the kind of culture that we want in our organization. It's sometimes maybe don't use that style and maybe use the style of come follow me and cast a vision. There's the coaching style of leadership that helps people with where they're at become, I wish every single person in an organization, Adam, was exactly who they need to be right now. I wish that they came in and they were all talented and they were amazing. The 80-20 principle. And ethical. Yes, of all the things, wouldn't they be great? They just came in, they were exactly our culture, they knew how to do the job and they didn't need anything from us. No, okay, that's just not reality, okay? So 80% of our people are gonna need us to coach them and develop them, but listen, if you're the kind of, if you're a leader and you're not used to how to develop people, you're not really sure you wanna get them here, but you don't know how to get them from here to here. You don't know how to teach somebody how to become the kind of leader and employee, right, that you want them to be. You're gonna, you're gonna not how to you, you're, just because you don't know how to use Use a sand wedge doesn't mean that you should keep using your putter. So we keep telling people what to do and we need to develop them to become something more than they are at right now. And leaders have to learn that just because they're used to leading a certain way doesn't mean that it's the most effective way for them to lead in all situations and all type of people. And that leadership that gets results, he, Daniel Goldman interviewed 3000 executives and he determined here are the type of behaviors that leaders need to have if they want to get the greatest impact in their organization. Awareness. It took me a minute to get the brilliance in the approach because that is like that. So that, that's a framework, right? Of leadership. There's these six different styles, <clears throat> but it's every bit as impactful as going from leaning backwards, thinking, you know how to ride a snowboard, right? Because you've met now my, my scenario was that I was my first day. A lot of these leaders you're talking about have been in charge for years, if not decades. And they think that leaning back is the way. All they got to do is lean forward. It worked when we were skateboarding. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's worked in different scenarios and it's gotten results and it's gotten them promotion and it, it might have gotten them a big house and a golf club membership. But it's not effective across the board. 
Not always, because if all you are is a hammer, then everybody has to be a nail. And there's no finishing work there either. And there's no polishing with a hammer. When I hear that, I'm like, okay, the paradigm shift is this. There's a multitude of ways to lead your people. And then you have to know them. That comes through the one-on-ones that you mentioned. Then you're exercising these different modes of leadership, even with different people from meeting to meeting. You're being a visionary to this person and you're being a lifter or an encourager to this person and an equipper to that one. But it's like, I almost, I was almost losing my train of thought, but it was like the, it's the same thing that I had that day with the snowboarding. I'll give myself a little pat on the back is the same thing that this leader needs right now to make that happen. It's less important. You'll learn the skills because you're smart. You'll figure that stuff out, the leadership styles, but what you need that isn't, can't be taught. And this is an issue of the heart is to be open and coachable, and that's humility. If you don't have that, you're already getting what you got, and it's not going to – there it is. Settle in. It starts at the top, Adam. We can't – companies don't change because the CEO doesn't change. Churches don't change because the senior pastor doesn't change. If we want to see change and get results on our team, it has to start with us. We have to be willing – Jim Collins talks about this in his book, Good to Great. If you haven't and your listeners haven't read this book, I highly recommend it. He did a research study where he said, what separates the great companies from the good ones? The great companies are led by a level five leader. What's a level five leader? A level five leader is a leader that when things are going right in their organization, they look out the window. They look out the window. That's right. To see what the people are doing that is working, that is getting the results. And when things are going wrong, they look in the mirror and they say, how could I be leading different? And Mm -hmm. if we're not getting the results we want with our team, then we absolutely have to look at the kind of leader that we are. Because if we're not getting the results, then everything starts with us. And we can complain about our people. We can be frustrated with them. We can think that it's their fault, but it's not their fault. It's our fault. We have the responsibility to, to lead our team, to lead our organization, to get the kind of results, to accomplish the mission. It is up to us to mobilize our people, to get them moving, to accomplish the mission. If our mission matters, otherwise it, then we don't care. But if our mission matters and it's that important, then we need to get people moving. I love that you keep giving that little accountability nugget because that's powerful. It, it reminds me every time, I'm like, oh, yes, make that distinction. That's, I, I love it. Okay, so we got good to great. Yep, that's just, Super powerful. And I'll, okay. I get these questions and then I forget them because I'm still like, oh yeah, keep going. What if, so the vast majority of people are not going to be in that position of the top. What do those people do who have this impact to make, who are trying to do things, but maybe they have an egomaniac leader, boss. Maybe the person who owns the small business, the construction company or whatever the thing is, maybe they're intolerable and closed minded and there's nothing, but this person's in there and they enjoy the company. Maybe that's their scenario. They just feel stuck in between a rock and a hard place. What can they do on their level? Because leadership's an inside job, right? We don't, we can't, we can, we can, if our mission matters, but our boss seems to be an obstacle in the way. And I've been in that scenario plenty of times, especially in the military. That's a really tough one because if the rank is like, this one doesn't have the option Like it just has to listen to this one. And a lot of times this one's the incompetent one, right? So what can that person do since they can take ownership? So in pillar two of my seven pillars, one of the sections, it's called power. The the pillar is called power, but it's because your power comes from your owning of your own responsibility, your own accountability and taking full ownership of what you can do where you are in that moment without excuse. So one of the sections has to do with CEOs and leaders and people like this to be accountable. But the other one has to do with people in a spot where they don't have the influence, but they're still accountable to lead. They're still accountable to influence and impact out of the positivity that, they, that they're dreaming about. What can that person do? What can they do? So John Maxwell talks about this is nothing new under the sun, that leadership is not about a position or a title. Leadership is about influence. One of the most important things to do, even if you're not the boss and you're having to report to somebody, like you said, that might be the incompetent one that that you might not feel like you have anything to do about, the best leaders know how to influence the people that are underneath them. 
the people that are their colleagues and they know how to influence the people that are above them. Leadership is influence. I would challenge that person to become a better leader themselves. Again, it goes back to, are they going to be a level five leader? Are they going to, when things are going wrong, blame their boss? Or are they going to look in the mirror and say, how could I influence my boss? How could I make a difference here? What could I do to create change? It's easy. There's, if you're looking for somebody to blame, you will always find somebody to blame. But if we're going to be great leaders, I'm not talking about having a title. I'm not talking about being the boss. I'm talking about if we're going to have great influence and make a great impact, then we must get rid of all of our excuses. We must take, as Jaco Willing says, extreme ownership there you go for what we can do to make a difference the first thing again it goes back to your ideology my theology of leadership is it's my fault it's my responsibility i am completely i completely own this and when you do that then you begin to be thoughtful and creative about what do i need to do to influence my boss to influence my colleagues to influence the people that are reporting to me because also just because you're the boss and have people reporting to you doesn't mean that you have all the impact does it, does it mean that you have influence? So it's all about influence, Adam. That's what yep. you need to be most concerned about. Man. So speaking of that, why don't you run down a few of the bragging bullet points on your resume in terms of the church growth, the numbers that you guys have seen, and it's not all about numbers, but numbers absolutely shed a light. And in a lot of places, that's all you go off of. Yeah. And because the numbers... They don't lie, especially in business. We know this. They don't lie. So talk a little bit about that because obviously you've landed in front of the Kellers of the world and the Coveys of the world. It probably wasn't an accident. You probably didn't work your way in there by buying cupcakes and sending them to their gatekeepers at the building. You're rubbing elbows with these people. You've produced some results of your own. Talk about whatever you'd like to with that and the growth that you've helped assist. I, I, ha I know exactly who I am and what my mission is, and I'm unapologetic about it. I'm crazy passionate. Whether it's connecting with people in the church, whether it's connecting with leaders at Grant Cardone Conference, whether it's connecting and doing a leadership mastermind in Puerto Rico, whether it's, it doesn't matter where I am. I am Nicole, and I am crazy passionate. Absolutely lost my mind about my relationship with God and connecting you to have a relationship with God. And I am so passionate about it that no matter who I connect with, I think God's the answer. That's just the truth, Adam. He is the answer. We were we are we were created to worship. We were created by God to to give our lives to something. And if we know that we're the answer, people are drawn to us. They they want to be around us. When I when I met Brian, I was we were both speaking at this mastermind event, and I was just talking on leadership how to create a leadership pipeline that produces a high impact team. There were unbelievers there that they just, they felt so connected to me, loved by me. And now I'm taking one of the couples through just a Bible study and the husband got saved recently, but the wife still has questions. And I love that. People bring me into their organization or their company because I'm not going to shove Jesus down your throat, but I'm hoping that I'm going to be so passionate and give so much value to you that you want to know the God that I serve. You want to know where that's coming from with regards to the, the church. Adam, we are seeing, we are seeing churches experience unprecedented growth, whether it's a new church plant, a church that's trying to break past the 200, 500,000 church growth barrier, or they're already a rapidly growing church we are absolutely seeing transformed lives. We planted a church a year and a half ago in Oklahoma in a town of a thousand people. Okay, this church, 95% of churches don't get above 200 people. Why? Because they're not empowering leaders. They're not. Yeah, for that's the limit of the they're, leadership. It's the limit of the leadership. This one church in Oklahoma, they're, they're at three services, seeing hundreds of people have given their life to Christ. There's another church that, that I, I've been working with for about eight months. They had 700 people in the church, but again, the leaders were, they were tired. They were burned out. They wanted to quit. They were filled with a lot of anxiety because they didn't know how to develop an executive leadership team. Mm -hmm. I come in with vision, with passion, with strategy, with answers, with solutions. And quickly we mobilize a team of 50 marketplace ministers who are running with the vision mobilized to accomplish the mission. And it was, it took some time, but not a lot of time to mobilize people and now they're experiencing incredible growth. Last year, the church saw 
239 people give their life to Christ. This year, we're on track to see about 1,300 people give their life to Christ. They went from two to three services. It's amazing what happens when we mobilize our teams, when we mobilize the church, when we mobilize our company. People want to see results. When I was at that mastermind, I say, listen, if your mission matters, we got to mobilize people to get it done. You have to become the kind of leader that gets results. Get results. If you are not getting results, if your mission is not getting accomplished, sir, get it together. I love you, but like you, you must get results. And I think that's why I connect with different types of leaders in oh different gosh. industries is oh because gosh. we, it's a leadership issue. It's not a prayer issue. It's not a Jesus issue. It's a leadership issue. You can't pastors love people, but they're not getting the job done because they don't know how to mobilize people towards accomplishing a vision. They don't know how to rally a team around a mission. They don't, they're not giving, people are, we're designed to give our lives to something. We're at tribal leadership. It's like we were designed mm -hmm. to be part of a tribe. We were designed to want to get something done, to get results. We've got to mobilize people around that mission and vision, empower them to get it done. And mm -hmm. I just love it. I love, I think that people want, I think that people want to know God. So I go to, Tim Story does these live events in Bel Air and Beverly Hills, and he's just adding value to people, right? strong believer healer and we go to these events and we're leading people to christ we're impacting people with the gospel in a quote-unquote secular environment people are so far from god but man there's something about our life there's something about tim's life there's something about my life there's something that it's like what do you have i don't have religion what do you have i have purpose i have connection with god i have answers i've got the remedy and people are so hungry for that dude that <laughs> The tap done. No, it, Tim, I know that. And then you're talking about this. It's difficult to, light is attractive. Yes. Light is attractive. And yet light will automatically repel darkness. Cause it's not going to attract everybody. Like darkness hates the light, but it's powerless against it. The smallest, I'd read in one of my journal entries recently, it's not my idea, but I was reminding myself in a journal entry somewhere a long time ago. I was like, the smallest bit of light drives out darkness. Just a little bit. Yep. The darkness can't survive where the light is. A little tiny flame in a big dark room, yeah. and that flame will not be snuffed out by darkness, but that's there right. will be no darkness within that flame. That's right. Like, and that's what you're doing. You're, that's how I believe that I've settled into walking in my faith as well. Because people, regardless of what they believe, they don't ever feel like I'm beating them over the head with the Bible. No, and that's, I don't. darkness is ignorance, Adam. It's like darkness isn't evil. It's just ignorance. People have an idea of what God is like, of what Christianity is all about. Of They, they have this impression and God doesn't send people to hell. God loves people. God wants people to be reached. People have this image that God is this judgmental, mad, angry, wanting to strike them down and know like God loved us so much that he sprinted from heaven to pay the penalty for our sins. And he is begging people, inviting people to have a relationship with him. I think that, that when we are light and we, we talk about Jesus and God for who he really is, that's why the Pharisees and the religious people, they hated Jesus and people loved Jesus hung around with tax collectors and sinners and was influencing and impacting people because he was good and he was loving. Yeah. A woman got caught in adultery and he says, hey, who are your condemners? Any of you that has sin, be the first to throw the stone, that is without sin, be the first to throw the stone. And, and he said, woman, who are they that condemn you? Go and sin no more. And you know what else I think he told her that's not recorded, Adam? I think he said, but even when you do, even when you mess up again, even when you don't, even when you make another mistake, because you're going to, I'm not, I'm still not going to condemn you. I'm still going to tell all your accusers to kick rocks. Yeah. When you, when and I love you. I love you. And I'm here and I'm about to die for you. And I, I'm going to, it's for all of your past, present and future sins. Like when I explain to people, Adam, who God really is, not how religion has portrayed him to be, but who he really is. They're attracted to that. They want that. God is love. Like, why wouldn't they want that? Why wouldn't they want to know a God that loved them so much that isn't here to judge them? He, God didn't send his son to judge. The world's already yep. condemned. And my, my view on that is real cut and dry, black and white. And that's only if your ego is more important. Only if your mission doesn't matter only in your parlance. Matters. My mission yeah. matters. It's so important. 
Now, let me ask you, how you talk about doing this out in the marketplace, in businesses, what, do you have the same kind of approach? Do you, are you this footloose and fancy free to use an old generation phrase with leading, coaching their leadership in the secular business place? Do you do it the same way? Do you have the same kind of The system is the same. It's the exact same in the church and it's the exact same in companies. The reality is Adam is his leadership is transferable. That's why you have people like John Maxwell and the 21 irrefutable laws of leadership, the 17 laws of teamwork transfer no matter where you're at. Good to great, right? Jim Collins yeah. wrote it for the nonprofit and the for-profit, right? Tony Shea, Zappos, delivering happiness, creating a culture people want to be a part of. All of this works in the church and in companies. When I am working with like a Christian business leader or a senior pastor, it's doing the one-on-ones. It's having your, how, what do you do in your weekly staff meeting? What do you do? What meeting do you need to have once a month? What meeting do you need to have every single quarter? What you need to do to rally everyone around the mission around what do you need to do to create a culture you're obsessed with? What do you need to do to have leadership that gets results is the same, no matter if it's in the church or the, or the business world. Now our mission is different, right? But the way that we accomplish that mission is to mobilize leaders. Yep. Okay. So you're not necessarily going into ABC hardware to their corporate office and to, to help them grow their culture and turn sales around. You're not going in there implementing a plan to have, let's say a church service or a prayer session, or you got to put discipleship in Jesus and in the word, like you got, you're not doing that in those places. No, you're using either. a systematic proven based on ancient wisdom model for leadership, developing leadership, which is exactly how Jesus would have been relational to us anyway. Yeah, exactly. The way, the way he developed his leaders. It. How do, what kind of leader do you need to be to get results? How do you create a culture you're obsessed with? And what systems and structures do you need to have in place to see your vision and your mission come to, to come to pass? And that's what I love working with companies and churches on. If you are a Christian business leader, yes, it is especially important. It is, it is, yeah. it matters so much. If you have to choose between being a pastor and a Christian business leader, please, for the love of God, go be a Christian business leader. I beg you, because our job as pastors, our job as pastors is to equip the Christian business leaders. Okay. That's our job. If that's what you want to do, if you are committed, if you are committed to equipping other Christian business leaders, fine, go be a pastor. But the mission is for us as leaders, right? To use our companies and our positions to influence people for the kingdom. Again, Christian business leaders, if I have to pick two people I work with, it's the senior pastors and it's the Christian business leader. The Christian business leader, I'm gonna help you create a whole culture in your company that people are obsessed with. I'm gonna help you get results that you want. I'm gonna help you develop leaders. We're gonna do all this stuff, but I'm gonna help you realize who you are. That who you are is an ambassador for Christ. You are actually a missionary. You are an undercover pastor. Only we don't have to invite these people to go to church on Sunday. They're actually coming to your church Monday right through here. Saturday, right here. It's Ooh. like, right here. It's like, you're the church, win the lost and make disciples, fulfill the great commission in your business. And if you are developing people, if you care about their family, if you care about their children, if you are coaching them to become better, maybe not right away, but eventually they're gonna wanna listen to who your God is. It's right. impossible for someone to be connected to you <clears throat> and eventually not get saved. Impossible. 9.9% Nine, nine, 99% of all unbelievers I come in contact with get saved. They don't have a fighting chance. They don't have a chance because I'm going to figure out how to lead you to Christ. I'm going to pray. I'm going to fast. I'm going to serve you. I'm going to, if I have my eyes set on you and I want to lead you to Christ. Yeah, you do have choices, but I'll make sure you know all of them. You feel so loved by me in the process. And if we as leaders, as Christian business leaders, will get this revelation ministry in the marketplace. We change the whole entire world. And the pastors will get this revelation that it's actually, there's no separation between the sacred and the secular. There's not kings and priests. And the people that are making the money and doing business are not called to just give money to our church. We are called to empower them and equip them to go into the world to fulfill the Great Commission. And when we get that revelation, that's who we're, how we're called to serve people, we actually stop seeing ourselves as the heroes. And we start seeing the marketplace leaders, the Christian business leaders as the heroes, as the ones that are called to make a difference. And that's what I'm so passionate about. I work with pastors because I'm trying to get to the people 
in their church to tell them who they are and how important their job is and to tell them to who they are in the marketplace. And then I go to Christian business leaders to say, hey, oh my gosh, like you're around unbelievers all the time. You don't even have to get them to come to church. Just go tell them right now. Do Bible studies before work. Do Bible studies at lunch. Get them connected to Christ. The church of God is the army on the earth today. So of course I'm gonna serve pastors and churches and mobilize them to accomplish the Great Commission. But I'm also gonna go, I'm, I, am, I refuse. I absolutely refuse to not be in the marketplace to not, I'm the presenting speaker and sponsor for LA Style Magazine, their 2023 premiere issue. It's the Grammy Museum. We've got the top industry leaders and influencers and celebrities coming to this event. I, I will never not accept opportunities like that. I'm going to be on Tim Story's panel for his Tim Story Live event. I will never turn down opportunities for that because I cannot reach people. I cannot connect people to Christ if I'm not connected to them. And I want to influence the influencers. I want to serve the leaders. I want to be around the, I'm asking all these pastors and leaders to go be in the world. I'm going to be in the whole world. I'm going to be so connected to them. I'm going to add value to their companies. I'm going to add value to their lives. And at some point, Adam, they're going to ask me about God. And I'm going to tell them, I'm going to change the whole world because we as Christians exist to win the lost. And CT Studd says this, some wish to live within the sound of a chapel bell. I wish to run a rescue mission within a yard of hell. Let's plunder Gangster. hell, late heaven. Gangster, like boss. It's, that's what we're called to do. And if we as Christians get that revelation, to serve people. Super today. powerful. Man, I love this idea and it's going to stick with me that a, a Christian leader in the business place, your church is where you work Monday through Saturday. That's right. Like they're coming to you. All you got to do is influence them and not be religious about it. That's not most people's problem. Probably hiding from any of it is their main problem out in the workplace. But man, <clears throat> so great. I have one more question to, for you, and then we're going to let you go. But I have a feeling we'll probably be seeing you again someday, sooner than later. Before we get there, how can people get a hold of you right now? We're going to put some stuff in the show notes. What's one or two key ways right now on the fly that you can drop to them to get in touch with you? I want them to text LEAD to 33777 because I must get them this article. They must take this assessment. They must understand this, their style of leadership, what they need to work on because they, we must get results. And when they text that number, they're going to get also get a link to my, to set up a free strategy call with me so they can do that. My website is connected with Nicole.com. My email is Nicole at connected with Nicole.com and my Instagram and TikTok, all the things are connected with Nicole. And yes, yeah. yeah, so I'd love to, to talk to your leaders in your audience, but just to tell them that, that they absolutely are going to accomplish their mission. They must accomplish their mission. They need to be kind of the kind of leaders that get results and mobilize and rally their team to accomplish the mission. You must know why you exist. And if you know why you exist, rally your team around it and then become the kind of leader that gets results because it matters. Yeah, if it matters to you, right? If it matters, if it matters to if you. If it matters, then, you know, then go do what Adam did in the bathtub or whatever that is that you said. <laughs> Listen, I know this. You all got your phone in your hand right now or it's within an arm's reach because you're listening and you're still breathing. Because I know that if our phones get out, out of reach of arm's reach, right, we start breathing, we start having trouble breathing. So you got your phone. Freaking pick the thing up, start a new thread, 33777, yep. and type in the word, Type in the letters L-E-A-D and hit send. Do it right now. At least open the gate. You'll be connected to Nicole. Get some of her resources and up your game, man. Up your game if your mission matters. Now, last thing, a little bit of fun. Been trying to, been working on this lately. I need three things from you, your drivers in life. These are this, no, no paragraphs, no even sentences if you can help it. That's part of the challenge. Either a one or two word phrase if you got to use a sentence, you can. If you got to use an idea, you can. But the three things that drive you, that keep you inspired, people will ask, how do you stay motivated? This, this will answer that question easily. This is more, how do you stay strong? How do you not grow weary? How do you keep your mindset in spirit, inspired? What are your three things? People. Oh. <laughs> people. I love God, Adam, but I love people. I'm good with God. I don't have to do one more thing for him the rest of my life. I'm right with him. We're good. We're, I'm going to heaven. I'm here. 
for people. I love people. I'm obsessed with people. Mm. I care about people. I want to serve people. So my why is my next door neighbor. My why is my sister. My why, people. I exist for people. And that's, that's why I'll never stop. As long as there's one more person that I'm called to serve that I can serve, then I'm never stopping. I'll never stop. Schindler's List. Just I, one more. One more. One more. We'll yep, do it for one yep. more. One more. As long as there's one person. So people, people, that's all about people. I challenge people to test you on that right now. Text lead 33777. Isn't that funny? I was waiting for it. I wanted to be a little cheesy radio guy. Oh my God, Adam. <laughs> that's my answer. That's, that, that is a beautiful, I love it. I love the wrap up. And I love how the fact that you don't even include your absolute foundation and the three things that drive you on earth. That's a different take. And it first struck me as odd. And then as you're talking, I'm like, yeah, why would I use up the, that's there. That's my security. My heart, soul, mind, and strength are already sold out. That's handled. I don't need to put that in my daily agenda for things that can drive me. Like it's become who I am. That's, I love that take. You also said something that sparked something else. People got to bring it back to me. We're going to have to edit this out. I forgot it left. I've, I get really good. I've gotten good over the years of listening intently and not getting distracted. Every now and again, I'll put a note that has to be, but then I'm like, and then, but in doing that, I'm not thinking about what I'm going to say. Thoughts will come in. I'll be like, okay, dude, hold that. And then I have to listen. And then it just goes away because I literally learned to stop thinking about what I was going to say and just actively listen. We're the same. I relate with you. I'm a little bit numb because I like the approach and yeah, it's beyond the approach. I love your mindset the radical nature. Love that. Nicole, you've been an absolute pleasure. More than expected. What did we meet less than two weeks ago? And that's the power of association that I also discuss in the seven pillars, the power of nurturing your environment. And when you're around the right people, things can happen because leverage can happen. The two of you can synergize your strengths and lift each other up. And I'm really grateful and a little bit beside myself in a good way that you came on today, that we're here, we got it done. I'm heading out for travel in a week and podcasting is at a minimum over the next couple of weeks until I get resettled and because opportunities are coming, right? They're happening and we got to get the message out because the mission freaking matters. That's right, Adam. Thank you so much for having yeah. me. Thanks for listening to the leading show on helping family-driven professionals end discontentment, live their authenticity, and experience revolutionary freedom. I hope you're stronger for having invested your time with us today. If our content has impacted you in a meaningful way, please share this episode with someone you know. Also, and critically important, please leave a review and let us know. That way you can help someone you've likely never met experience the impact you have. If you're looking for more resources to help you grow and get unstuck, be sure to check out revolutionaryfreedom.com and apply for a free strategy call with me. This is a no pressure introductory coaching call where you help me understand what's holding you back. I'll give you the best feedback I possibly can. Plus, we'll get to know each other a little bit and see if there's a fit. You can also download a free overview of the seven pillars of revolutionary freedom by entering your email for an instant download. And if you have any questions or comments, we'd love to hear from you. Email me at Adam at adamkasics.com and I will reply personally. Remember, the key to ending discontentment and experiencing revolutionary freedom is raising your awareness to that which has you stuck. If you already knew how to get unstuck, you'd already be where you want to be. Let us see if we can help you as I've helped hundreds of others. Take that first step right now. Request a free call. I'm here to guide you every step of the way. Thanks again for your trust and I'll see you next time on the Revolutionary Freedom Podcast. That's sweet. It was great.